I'm here at PDX LAN where hundreds of gamers are currently gaming right behind me. So how do you build a network with super low latency and super high bandwidth to make sure that all of these gamers do not drop their connections and have a great experience at this event? Let's go take a look. It all starts by running ethernet out to the attendees. The cables go through these channels and then each row of tables has two 48 port switches that the users connect into. The internet is a Comcast 10 gigabit fiber connection that terminates into a Microtik CCR1072 router. The CCR1072 is a 72 core router that was barely breaking a sweat with this amount of internet traffic. I saw sustained internet download speeds between three to five gigabits per second, and the peak download usage during the event was around seven and a half gigabits per second. The main LAN is a flat slash 16 subnet that has about 650 client devices connected to it. That's not counting the public Wi-Fi network, which is a UDM SE with DPI enabled and two U6 mesh access points providing the SSID. The main core switch has a 40 gigabit uplink to the router and then feeds out one gigabit to each satellite switch, even though the core switch itself has 48 10 gigabit ethernet ports for even more speed out to the tables if needed. They have multiple Intel Nook PCs set up to provide services such as Grafana Statistics and PRTG. If any of the end user table switches goes offline, a Discord bot sends notifications to the staff to go check it out ASAP. All of this traffic is also filtered through a 2U Suricata server that's doing layer seven filtering in case anyone starts doing peer-to-peer -peer file sharing, AKA torrenting. If anyone's caught torrenting, they're banished to a VLAN that has no internet access, but pops up a captive portal page going over the rules of the network and it won't let them back into the main LAN until they're no longer torrenting and they've agreed to the terms. And of course, as you can imagine, setting up this scale of temporary network creates an awful lot of cabling, but no real need to make it look pretty when it's just a four day event. So there you have it, a quick look at the type of network infrastructure needed to ensure that all of these users have an uninterrupted gaming experience for this massive four day LAN party. That was a video that I posted to TikTok a couple of weeks ago. And by the way, I am on TikTok now. You can follow me at Crosstalk Solutions. So it generated a ton of comments and questions and I wanted to use this video to answer some of those questions. The first question was on the Slash 16 subnet. A Slash 16 subnet has over 65,000 available IP addresses. So then why use such a large subnet when there are less than a thousand connected devices? Now I asked the admin this exact question when I was there and he basically just shrugged his shoulders and said, you know, because it's easy. So in a long-term production environment, you probably don't want too much IP overhead in your subnets, but it, is it really like a super bad thing? I mean, the biggest issue that you'd likely run into with a slash 16 subnet is if you actually had tens of thousands of devices in that single subnet. The size of the layer two address tables your switches would have to manage may be too large for the switches to handle. Also, other non-network specific devices like printers could possibly become overwhelmed with the amount of broadcast traffic that's happening and that could cause them to start malfunctioning. But for this four day temporary event, they needed something larger than a slash 24 and a slash 16 is just easy to remember. I mean, slash 24 is 255, 255, 255, zero. Slash 16 is 255, 255, zero, zero. Now, the actual ideal size subnet for this network of about 650 devices probably would have been a slash 22, which is subnet mask 255.255.252.0. But again, that's not as easy to remember to configure on all of your devices. And when you've got this level of enterprise networking equipment and less than a thousand clients connected, it really doesn't make that much of a difference and was absolutely not a problem during the event. Another big question had to do with their torrenting setup. So let me explain that in more detail. All of the traffic from the switch that feeds out to the internet was port mirrored to an additional port in that switch. Then there was a 2U server running Suricata, which is an open source network analysis and threat detection software. Suricata can run standalone or oftentimes it's a plug-in on certain routers such as PFSense. In this case, the Suricata server was doing layer seven filtering, also known as application layer filtering, and it had rules set up 
so that when peer-to-peer -peer file sharing was detected, Siracata would pull those users out of the main VLAN and then insert them into a new VLAN that blocked their internet access. All attempts to access the internet would be redirected to a captive portal explaining the rules of the event and it would prompt them to agree to those rules. Now once they had checked the box and you know also stopped torrenting, Siracata would then move them back into the main VLAN and they could continue gaming. This generated a ton of questions and controversy. Lots of people wanted to know how the Siracata thing worked. And if you're interested in a separate video on that, let me know down in the comments below. But mostly people wanted to know why peer-to-peer -peer file sharing wasn't allowed. And there's a bunch of reasons for this. Not that any of those reasons actually matter, right? This is a private event with terms and conditions. If they say no torrenting in their terms, you're agreeing to those terms when you buy your ticket. And that's it. I mean, they are allowed to make their own rules. But the most obvious reason to disallow torrenting is because it's gonna suck up a bunch of bandwidth, right? If too many people start torrenting, that could potentially saturate the 10 gigabit internet connection. I mean, it's not entirely likely, but it could possibly happen, and that's a really good enough reason to block it. But the actual real reason that they don't allow torrenting is because it's likely going to be used to pirate software, right? Someone is gonna be at this event, they're gonna see someone else playing a game that they want, and they're going to try to get that game without paying for it. And you may say, well, who cares, right? That's their decision to pirate that software, let, it, let them get in trouble, right, if they wanna get caught. But wait a minute, this isn't their internet connection, right? What happens when you're at home and you try to pirate some software and you get caught? Like if you're not using a VPN, right? You get a nasty warning letter from your ISP telling you that they detected you downloading such and such software on whatever date and you need to cut it out or they're gonna disconnect your internet, right? PDX LAN is held at the Clark County Event Center just north of Portland, Oregon. The Clark County Event Center has a 10 gigabit internet pipe from Comcast that PDX LAN uses for this event. If the network administrators of PDX LAN just let anyone use that internet connection to download pirated software, Comcast could potentially disconnect the internet for that entire event center. Or at the very least, they'd receive a ton of nasty letters that I'm sure the owners of the event center wouldn't be too happy about, and it could jeopardize the future of PDX LAN events at that location. Now, of course, peer-to-peer -peer file sharing isn't just about pirating software and movies. There are legitimate uses for torrenting as well, but now we get back to the PDX LAN rules. If there's really some legitimate piece of software that you have to download while you're at this event for four days and the only way to get it is with peer-to-peer -peer file sharing, then guess what? I mean, you're just out of luck, right? The organizers of PDX LAN aren't going to jeopardize their host's internet connectivity because you didn't plan ahead. Finally, there were a lot of comments about the one gigabit distribution from the core switch out to each of the attendee table switches. Commenters were wondering if that was enough bandwidth and why the admins didn't run 10 gig connections out to those satellite switches. Well, let's do the math on that, right? Each row of tables seats 48 attendees and there's two 48 port switches per row of tables. That means a one gigabit connection to the core switch for every 24 attendees. The total internet connection for the entire event is 10 gigabits. So what benefit do you think would come from running 10 gigabit links to each satellite switch, considering that there's never going to be a need to max out the existing one gigabit link? Also think about this, by only providing one gigabit uplinks to each satellite switch, you're capping the maximum amount of internet bandwidth any one switch can use up. Or in other words, by ensuring that none of the satellite switches can use more than one gigabit of traffic, you're mitigating any potential damages that a single user or single table could cause while also providing more than enough bandwidth for the attendees. To me, this really comes down to the quality of network administrator running of the event, right? Just because you can do something doesn't mean that you should, right? It doesn't mean that it's a good idea. It's not the best idea to open up too much bandwidth to your users when your users could potentially exploit that bandwidth and affect the gaming experience for other attendees. I hope you enjoyed this in-depth look at the temporary network that is set up for PDX LAN twice a year. And if you'd like to keep watching, check out these videos on the right that I have hand-picked for you. The first is a look at a complete network setup that I did for a remote paragliding company. And the second is the story of my two days spent in Florida doing tech work to support the relief efforts for Hurricane Ian. Thank you so much for watching.